So when I was very young, I was quite enamored of this technology. You know, I built an atom smasher when I was in high school. <laughs> And I assembled uh, 400 pounds of transformer steel. I went on 22 miles of copper wire on the football field. And I created a uh, 2.3 million electron volt Betatron electron accelerator. Didn't that, didn't that disturb people? <laughs> well, every time I plugged it in, I would blow out every circuit breaker in the house. <laughs> and all the lights would dim. <laughs> and, and my poor mother. You know, she probably yeah. said to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays basketball? <laughs> Maybe if I buy him a baseball, he'll find something uh, suitable. <laughs> and she once said, for God's sake, why can't you find a Japanese girl? I mean, How long was that? Building these machines in the garage. Uh, was your mom first generation Japanese? Uh, well, she um, was actually, uh, my father and mother were actually in the uh, relocation camps, the concentration camps in California during World War II. Okay, then I double my question down. Uh, I mean, a history like that, Professor, I, I didn't know that history of you, but I suspected the possibility. Mm -hmm. And um, when you really dig deep, there's got to be a part of you that all of that comes home to shape. Well, um, my parents were, first of all, were citizens of the United States. Uh, yes, my parents were born in California. Yes, sir. And my grandfather was in the 1906 uh, San Francisco earthquake. Uh, he was part of the cleanup operation in, in during the earthquake. And so, um, but, you know, even if you are citizens, you could be still arrested. And oh, you know, we apologize for those. In and, then, and then we paid money. And do you know what? We didn't change the ability of a president to be able to do it again. Did you know that? Yeah, the, they're still on the book. Yeah, uh, they're still on the books. The McCarran Act. That's right. Still on the books. The Supreme Court has never touched that. It's a minefield. So oh, why? It's still on the books, basically. You're exactly right. Uh, something for people to know. It could be done again. And, it's and kind of sobering. Within a matter of months, a hundred thousand people just shipped off yes. race tracks and then to the back. You bet. No, and all of that somehow, Professor. All of that uh, has got to shape you. you. Yes. Um, however, when I was young, like I said, I was very much pro-nuclear. Um, because this was the nuclear age, uh, atoms for peace was what everyone was talking about, I personally wanted to go to uh, you know the extreme in the sense of working on Einstein's unified field theory. I mean, that to me was the ultimate atomic physics. Um, but I was, you know, very much from nuclear in those days. Mm -hmm. But then I began, as a graduate student, I began to have doubts about the technology. And what said those? In other words, what began those doubts? Well, I began to hear about these incidents. I began to hear about the fatalities, even though we were told no one has ever died in a nuclear accident. And, uh, I was just a graduate student. Um, I had heard that, you know, bombs had essentially gone out of control. I had heard that uh, workers had been blown up, uh, you know, seven of them had been blown up in, in supercritical calcy accidents. And then when I became a professor, I had access to files. You know, I, I can get the files now. So I began to realize there was this whole hidden history that nuclear power plants are quite unstable unless you are very, very careful. And it's an unforgiving technology. Uh, well, one mistake and it blows up in your face. Well, uh, all right. Suppose I made the argument, and I will because I'm devil's advocate every now and Mm -hmm. uh, look, here in Nevada, we built a great big dam. During the building of that dam, to create electricity for Southern California now and uh, Southern Nevada, well, gee, you know, a lot of people died in the building of that dam. Uh, so accidents do happen when you're dealing with the creation of large projects and energy. Uh, a certain amount of accidents do happen, period. I mean, mm -hmm. people fell into that as a concrete tomb and died, and I forget how many died, but a substantial number. So what about factoring that in? Um, well, the difference is that if a nuclear power plant has been out of control, you can lose an entire city. Uh, the government did a computer study of reactors like Indian Point, located uh, well, about 20 miles north of where I'm sitting right now, and a big accident at any point two and three would cause about $300 billion in property damage, uh, would literally obliterate the entire New York area. And there are, you know, 20 million people that live within 50 miles of that nuclear power plant. And it, in some sense, if you take a look at the cold accounting of the numbers, it is perhaps the most dangerous commercial machine on the planet Earth. 
uh, and that was the $1980. In, in 2003 dollars, uh, that would probably be in excess of a trillion dollars property damage uh, if those reactors ever went up in smoke. And uh, if anyone today were to ask the government permission to site a nuclear power plant so close to New York City, mm -hmm. they would say, you're out of your mind. There's no way we're going to site a nuclear power plant that close to a city. And yet, here we are. We have Zion very close to uh, Chicago. We have Indian Point very close to New York City. And uh, now we know. The, the public knows after Three Mile Island and Chernobyl that these reactors are potentially unstable, and yet we were uh, building these things so close to New York City. And like I said, in the early 60s, they wanted to put a nuclear power plant in the center of New York City, in Ravenswood, Queens. Well, all right. What are next you, Archie Bunker territory. Yeah. What do you think we ought to be doing? In other words, if you could uh, reshape America and uh, the world policy, on the peaceful uses of nuclear power, uh, how would you have it? Well, I think we should first of all admit that the Adams for Peace program um, let the cat out of the bag. Uh, I'm, I'm a physicist. Uh, there's no law of physics really separating commercial from weapons technology. It's the same technology. You just increase the enrichment level from 3% to 90%. That's it. That's the difference. Uh, the Indians discovered this, and that's why they detonated their first bomb in the 1970s uh, using an experimental uh, can-do reactor. Uh, they, they took this Atoms for Peace program, which was never designed to make bombs, but the physics is the same. Uh, the Indians were not stupid. They surreptitiously refined um, the nuclear waste, and they detonated their first bomb in the 1970s. That's true. And, and now we have this technology proliferating all over the place. Uh, take a look at North Korea. Uh, North Korea has uranium technology, which shocked us. We didn't think they had uranium technology. And where did they get it? Uh, the New York Times said they got it from Pakistan. Mm. Well, where did Pakistan get this uranium technology from? Essentially from Germany and the United States. Uh, we, we allowed that technology to flood into Pakistan during the Afghan war when Ronald Reagan was opposing the, uh, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And he wanted a billion dollars a day to go to the Afghan rebels. Well, that's okay. But what happened was... Uh, the, the Pakistanis wanted something in exchange. So you're saying we are the proliferators? Believe it or not. Well, I, it or not. I do. It's, I it's do. hard to believe, but you no. have, when you when you really get your hands around it, the United States winks at Pakistan, and Pakistan winks at North Korea. No, that was and a day. And we're shocked when North no. Korea comes up with uranium enrichment technology. There was a day when that would have shocked me, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm way past that. You know, ever since the the, the tests on pregnant women and the tests on the American public and radiation testing and all that was admitted to. Um, it's hard to get shocked after after all of that. Mm -hmm, right. And so this Adams for Peace program, uh, uh, I tell you, you know, a lot of countries are not stupid. They know there is almost no difference between weapons technology and commercial technology except sure. the enrichment level, which of course affects the chemistry a bit, mm -hmm. but it's basically the enrichment level that, that you want. And, and the Iranians, believe it or not, are absolutely correct in stating that all they want is commercially available technology from Russia. And President Clinton was the first American president to admit that commercial technology, which is legally available, can be used to make atomic bombs. Sure. And the Iranians were saying, no, wait a minute, we obeyed the letter of the law. You set the rules. You made the rules. The West made the rules. We followed the rules. Yeah. And, yeah, the Iranians apparently want to build an atomic bomb, and they're using commercial technology to do it. So I think we have to recognize the Adams for Peace program uh, was inherently flawed. In fact, just last week, the director of the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency said so much. He said it's fundamentally flawed that this old architecture of Adams for Peace was a big mistake in some sense. Oh, 